you, Diane. Hi, everybody. Um, so hopefully you uh, aren't too sick of the term operator. We're going to talk about it for a little more. Um, and uh, I want to talk about the state of some of the tools that we have to build operators, the state of the ecosystem, um, and kind of where we go from here. Um, just want to give a little bit of background on operators in case you're kind of, you know, you've heard the term, but you don't know where it came from. Um, it basically maps to the adoption phases of apps in Kubernetes, much like we've heard from all the folks on stage today. Um, and it really, uh, you, you know, we kind of went from stateless applications with, you know, just uh, scale out like Nginx pods and caching and some of the stuff that you heard about earlier. Um, very easy to replicate. Um, but then really quickly, you want to get into stateful uh, workloads. And, you know, we've got things in Kubernetes like the container storage interface and stateful sets to help you um, do that. And you can, you know, get a very simple Postgres um, deployment going where you're just sharing storage and, you know, it's following the pod around in the cluster. Um, but very quickly, we've moved on to complete distributed systems. Um, so, you know, you don't have all the primitives in Kubernetes that you need um, to do things like data rebalancing. There's no kube object for data rebalancing. There's no kube object for backups um, or seamless upgrading of an operator. Um, and so this is where, you know, running these com complex distributed systems need one level higher than the Kubernetes API. Um, and if you haven't guessed what provides this, it's an operator. Um, and uh, what is an operator at its core is really taking um, expertise from the folks that know how to run and scale that software, um, what it takes to install it, to fail it over, to scale it up, scale it down, um, whatever you need to do. Take the operational expertise and bake it into a piece of software um, such that you can combine that piece of software with some desired configuration and out pops a bunch of Kubernetes objects. Um, so, you know, we're not interacting. If you've ever uh, run a complex distributed system on Kube and you've got like 35 different YAML objects um, for all kinds of stuff, um, you know, it gets kind of crazy. All you need to do is interact with one kind of top level config for the operator. Uh, the exciting thing about this is that you're building on Kubernetes primitives. So since all this stuff ends up as deployments and stateful sets and config maps and secrets, you're not reinventing how any of that works. You know, we've got thousands of um, engineers that work upstream on Kubernetes making secret handling really great, making service discovery really great. You don't need to reinvent that. Um, but what you can do is use all that, if you think of that as your toolkit, you can use all of that to then construct your application. It doesn't have to be like a traditional three-tiered web app. It can be all kinds of architectures. Um, you can have anything under the sun. And because then you're using that Kubernetes under the hood, these are now truly hybrid apps. They can work on any conformant Kubernetes cluster. And then you have uniform uh, deploy, debug um, experience using kubectl, um, using any tooling that you've already built around the Kubernetes API. Uh, and this is really great when you have engineers that are either moving between teams or, uh, as we heard about earlier, oh, everyone's kind of doing 90% of the same thing in either their Jenkins pipeline or whatever the tooling that they built to deploy applications. So you can share a bunch of that knowledge um, using an operator as well. Do we want that? Does that sound great? Is that the nirvana that we want to be here? All right. Then we're, we're going to talk about how we get that. Um, and it starts out with the operator framework. Um, this was a collection of open source tools that um, we introduced about a year ago now, and it really has two main uh, use cases. We've got um, folks that are in the community and for builders that are, you know, uh, distributing software. Um, so this allows you to very easily create an operator around your application. Um, and this can be either like a database that you might sell as a commercial vendor, it might be an open source um, ecosystem like the TensorFlow community, or it might be an internal application within your bank, your insurance company, uh, your e-commerce shop, whatever you do. Um, and then at some point, you need to actually deploy that out on a cluster, and that's done by some end users, whether those are SREs within your organization, they might be customers of yours. Um, and they want to keep this stuff up to date, you know, uh, in the days of all these security vulnerabilities, of which we just, you know, had a new one last week. Um, this stuff needs to be up to date. You need to have a stream of updates coming down. Um, we think the, a stream of updates to the operator, which then operates the software, um, makes a ton of sense. So if you haven't looked at the SDK and uh, the lifecycle manager and operator metering, those are the components of the framework, at least the, the three main ones. Um, and these are uh, tools that roughly map to building new operators, um, running those operators on a set of clusters, um, and then collecting metrics and other things at scale once you have, you know, you're running a thousand databases with an operator. Um, these are all housed in a vendor neutral GitHub org, um, operator dash framework, and we've got a collection of, of all this software as well as a few other projects there as well. 
Um, one thing that's really important to understand when we're talking about operators is we have this maturity model. And uh, this is really important because these things can be really complex, um, and every application is a little bit different, but we want to be able to map these um, so we can talk about them in conjunction with each other. And uh, at the bottom here, you'll see um, some of the flavors of the SDK, which we're going to talk about. And these are roughly how this technology maps to these maturity models. Um, this isn't like a perfect diagram. You know, you can get um, kind of between a bunch of these phases. Um, and you don't have to use any of our SDKs as well. Um, but this roughly gets from, you know, table stakes is install and upgrade. Everybody here is doing that with software today. So, you know, you just have to have that in this modern ecosystem. But all the way to the right-hand side of this is if you picture like the smartest cloud service that you've ever seen, um, you know this is something that is horizontally and vertically auto-scaling, um, auto-tuning based on the number of requests or the type of workload that it's um, processing. Um, you know it's something that's auto-upgrading, auto-backup, um, whatever it is, auto-failover. Um, this picture that cloud service. This is what that category is all about. And what these SDKs and all the community that we're building around this is designed to do is to get everybody to this, um, this phase five of this maturity model. Um, and uh, we think that's kind of the, the key for having this truly hybrid cloud and the experience that you actually want, that cloud-like experience, but on-prem, um, on any hardware you want, in your um, private data centers, behind your, you know, your lockdown environment on Amazon, whatever it is, um, this truly uh, cloud-like experience powered by Kubernetes. So how do we get there? Um, the first step is taking uh, either one of our SDKs off the shelf, or you can just you know, build an operator yourself. Um, and uh, what this feeds into is these three flavors share some things in common. And um, the testing framework is the first. And this is really, really important, because if you picture like a database operator, it's a Postgres operator, let's say, um, there's going to be this desired state loop in there that's comparing all the Postgres's that you have out there, um, if they need to do leader election, if they need to do failover, if they need to be backed up, whatever it is. And uh, you want that to work. You don't want it, you know, you're in production and your databases are getting deleted by your operator and you don't have your backups or your backups aren't running. You know, that's re really, really critical that this is well tested. And so our SDKs help you do that no matter what technology that you're using. Um, and then we go into um, something that we have called a scorecard. And this is just something that's like a kind of black box testing for an operator to make sure, can I instantiate this on a cluster? When I um, give it a custom resource, does it actually do something? There's a proxy that will um, instrument the Kubernetes API calls that it's making. So we can kind of verify that it's doing the right thing. And with all of this, you can uh, just kind of rest assured that you have a very high quality operator um, because you know, you're trusting your stateful workloads, um, your complex apps to this thing. And then eventually, um, we have an operator hub, which we're going to talk about, um, that houses all of this. So I want to talk through some of the SDKs, because in the high level um, that you get um, some of the previous presentations, you know, uh, just dig a little bit into the technical details um, so you kind of know what you're getting into if you want to go home and build one of these. And the first uh, and easiest way to get started is with our Helm SDK. Um, I call this like the quote unquote no code. Um, this is different than Kelsey Hightower's no code thing, if you're familiar with that. Um, it's pretty funny. Uh, and what this allows you to do is we've written all the tooling for you to take an existing Helm chart, build it into an operator, and then run that on a cluster. Um, so it's constantly looking for changes to your desired configuration, which is like your Helm uh, values.yaml, and then applying those out, kind of rerunning that templating. Um, and this is what it all takes to do it, is um, you can just go say, this is a, I want to take the stable Tomcat chart, build it into an operator. Um, the nice thing about what this is doing under the hood is it is a container build. So you know, we like containers because they're immutable artifacts. We can version them, and then we know that we're going to get the same deployment outside uh, when we run it on this cluster or that cluster. Um, you get the same thing with an operator. This Helm chart is now built into a container and versioned so that when you run that on any number of your clusters in like a QA process and kick it off in a Jenkins pipeline, you know that you're always going to get the same output given the same input. And then, uh, because I said it's you know kube native tooling, um, you know if you have kubectl get tomcats or oc get tomcats here, um, you see we've got two of them running, totally native into the experience that you're used to. All these things get written out to like the Kubernetes audit log. You can put RBAC around them. Um, all just a really great experience. All kube native. And what you're operating against is that Tomcat object that you see, which is a custom resource. Um, it's an instance of a custom resource definition. And the exciting thing is um, that is your API surface now. You can change your operator as much as you want, um, implementing new features, adding new things. But this, this object is what um, your end users are going to be coding against. 
And so uh, we have an Ansible SDK that gets you um, much the exact same experience, but if you have an investment in Ansible playbooks and that you're kind of, um, you know, maybe you have a more OPSI background than like a traditional software development background, this is a really great way to get started there. Um, the input instead of a chart is an Ansible playbook, and you you know map those playbooks to certain events that happen on the cluster. Um, you know I change this value and run this playbook kind of thing, and you get the exact same experience on the end. Uh, so you same uh, object schema, um, you get the same experience on OC. Um, so it doesn't matter what technology that you use to build these. And last, uh, the last flavor of our SDK is our Go SDK, and this is you know kind of the cream of the crop, the most powerful SDK that we have. And under the hood, this is using all the same tooling as Kubernetes developers use upstream. Um, so you can write extremely powerful operators. And this is what a lot of the um, stateful workloads like the Mongos and the Redis and Couchbase and Crunchy Data, all these folks use um, because they just need a, a lot of control over what's happening in the operator. Um, and this code chunk that I have here is a really simple stubbed out uh, desired state loop. This is what your operator is constantly running. And so when I talk about you know, bringing the operational expertise to, um, that you have about your piece of software, this is what you're writing. Um, so here we're just saying, oh, if you know, we don't have any Tomcats, this is an initial deployment, so here's the code to go construct one of those. Um, it's these staple sets, it's uh, create this config map, generate this TLS cert, map it into these pods, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You would stub all that out there. And then um, you've just got uh, this constant loop running about checking you know, all the parameters of your Tomcats. And you know, if, you, if your operator knows how to do a new thing in the future, then it can upgrade those into that um, is a really key part of that. And so that's the kind of, you know, we wrote all the logic to talk to the Kubernetes API and all those types of things so that you can just focus on writing this desired state loop. So we're really, really excited about how operators have taken off across the industry. I mean, you've heard it a bunch here. Um, you know, it, it was a, a big thing um, at Red Hat Summit last week. Um, and uh, it's kind of just taken off. And so we've got a bunch of great partners that are writing operators that have listed them on Operator Hub. And the idea here is to have um, your end user software engineers, the folks that you are supporting, or if you're on one of these teams, um, to get workloads running really quickly in a production ready environment without having to be an expert. So uh, if you need to run a Spark cluster, um, you need to know how to use Spark, of course, but you don't need to be an expert in, oh, this component, when it comes up, it does service discovery and talks to this thing and load balancing works like this. You, know, you just need to be kind of at a very high level um, times every workload that you run from uh, you know, messaging queues um, to stateful workloads to uh, machine learning, uh, AI workloads, all that type of stuff. Um, I wanted to call out one example which is kind of cool, which is Amazon has a service operator. This is listed on Operator Hub with all the other operators that we have. Um, and what this does is translate Amazon objects like a, an S3 bucket or an RDS database or whatever into Kubernetes CRDs. So once again, you're using that kube native tooling. You can put RBAC around who can create these, who can modify them. Uh, but behind the scenes, it's actually talking to Amazon and creating um, you know, all those objects for you. Um, and so I think that's where we're going to see the um, operator's uh, concept going, is starting to talk to other remote resources, um, you know, connecting with internal workflows that your organization might have, um, much like we heard from Six earlier about, you know, you have this new project request form, it goes and actually populates something out on the cluster and reports back, I think we'll see a lot more of that type of stuff um, once we get a little more advanced. So I told you uh, we have to iterate uh, through that desired state loop. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see how that actually either informs your knowledge of what your application actually does. And so we're going to hear from our panelists in a second, um, hopefully about some things that they've learned about their own applications uh, just by building an operator. Because um, you have to really shift your mindset into how this works. You're using the Kubernetes cluster as your source of truth. Um, you, know, you don't want to uh, require outside input because then um, you're not going to get the same result if you just give this operator to somebody else. Um, and then ultimately, at the end of the day, you're just going to make all these kube objects. And uh, it's always worth keeping in mind as you're building these operators that what we're going for here is what you've seen a lot of the folks up on stage talking about, which is self-service for engineers. Um, whether it's a UI like you see here or on a command line, you're interacting, in this case, with a MongoDB replica set. So this gets you, um, you know, an HA uh, production-ready form of MongoDB. You can use that and you know, keep it in a Git repo, for example, and do GitOps. Um, but it's self-service, so you can tune this if you've got um, 
settings you want to move from staging to production. You don't have to get your admins involved. You don't need to you know, deal with your central IT team, which is a really, really powerful concept when you want to have you know, 40 teams sharing a cluster. Um, this is the only way that you can kind of scale to that. And uh, I mentioned GitOps, and you've heard it today. Um, the GitOps power is, is really, really cool when this works. So you can um, you know, think about uh, like a pull request maybe that you've seen recently for a bunch of kube objects. I mentioned sometimes you have this, uh, you know, a complex app that's made up of 35 Kubernetes objects. Um, you're reviewing uh, someone who made a change that has to go talk to maybe 20 of those things. It's a new secret that you need to wire through everything. Um, now you're reviewing these 35 things. You're not maybe a, an expert in all of them because it's a front end and a back end, for example. Um, and so you're kind of like, yeah, that PR seems good, but I don't really know how this actually bubbles through everything. Um, but wouldn't you rather just go look at two of these um, very high-level YAML objects and say, oh, yeah, I can see that you know, we're scaling up the MongoDB and we you know, aren't touching the front end. Or, oh, yeah, we're um, tweaking both of these configurations to have better uh, security policy, whatever it is. Um, and so this is the power of this is, especially as you onboard more and more teams onto a cluster, if you want to introspect what's going on, you need a higher-level view versus you, know, you might have 1,500 pods, as we saw, or you know, we've got clusters that have thousands and thousands and thousands of pods on them. Um, very hard to see what's going on. Um, and then as an admin, uh, you have full insight into the operators that are running. And you know, we were talking about that stream of updates. You need to know exactly, uh, maybe in production, you don't uh, subscribe to a stream of updates from Couchbase, for example. Uh, but in staging or dev or in everyone's individual environment, you do. And this is really powerful, but you also need to be able to see uh, what versions is everything at, um, what channels am I on, and different namespaces. So you can see that inside of the OpenShift console. Um, you can also interact with these via the command line. Um, the, this is the operator lifecycle manager at play behind the scenes. And it's all built on CRDs as well, so you can interact with them any way that you want. And most importantly, lock down the RBAC around them. Um, so uh, I want to encourage you to try this out. We've got a getting started guide that ties together the entire operator framework. Uh, but you can also look at getting started guides for all of the flavors of SDKs that we saw. Um, so if, if you've got Helm charts, if you want to try the Ansible SDK or give it a whirl for the entire Go um, SDK, you can find all that on the top link. Um, we also have an operator uh, special interest group that meets as part of OpenShift Commons. And this is a group of folks like yourselves that are um, solving problems together, um, showing off things that they've made, um, trying to figure out what's the best practice for doing X or Y. And some things that we're working on in this group are things like, um, if you're familiar with the open service broker and its uh, binding concept, bringing that into the operator ecosystem. What does that look like? How do operators work together? If you've got a, a cluster monitoring operator and a database operator, um, can you auto orchestrate um, monitoring of that database? Those types of things are all things that we're talking about in this SIG. So we'd love to have you um, and bring your use cases to that as well. And then lastly, if you're just, you just want to consume some operators or see which ones are out there, operatorhub.io is constantly updated. Um, I think you know, we've got uh, 30 or 40 operators on there right now. Um, you can also find these inside of an OpenShift 4 cluster, as you saw this morning. Um, so really exciting community that we're building there. Um, and if you have an operator that you want to list, um, please let us know. It's kind of a, a pull request process um, that you can do on GitHub as well. Uh, so with that, we're going to start our panel. Um, so if our panelists could start coming up here. Um, and I'll be around afterwards. would love to take your questions about building operators um, a little bit later on.